Welcome to Fiscal Science 101. This is a course that can satisfy a general education degree requirement for physical sciences. It will also serve as an introduction to four areas of physical science, physics, chemistry, geology, and astronomy. Of course, I can't cover all these topics in depth, um, but we will try to hit the high points of each subject. I will tend to follow your textbook with a few topics from other material that I'll hand out or cover in lecture. There is no math requirement for this course, but we will uh, use math. Uh, you basically need to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. You'll need to memorize some mathematical equations and how to, to use them. Um, but we need to use some math because of in science we are forever measuring things, and we need to use the math in our, our measurements. I have handed out PowerPoint slides I used last semester, so you can see what I'm lecturing about, but you will also need to take notes on things that I say or do um, on the board um, that are not in the handouts. So chapter one in your book will cover introductory topics shown on the slide, and I think what I'll do is I'll split the chapter one topics into uh, three different uh, videos to, um, to save some space. Um, in this slide, it is an overview. Uh, first, we'll, uh, first a brief historical look at the development of science, and then I will shift to the famous success of interpreting the night sky based on science, the solar system. Um, I have to warn you that, is, that the astronomy example of Ptolemy and Copernicus is not in your book so you will have to get it from the lecture, but the rest of the topics are in your book. There we go. Good. If we go way back to the time hundreds to thousands of years BC, there were certainly great discoveries like the wheel, agriculture, how to make useful materials like copper and bronze, but to a much greater degree than today, <clears throat> um, nature was explained by supernatural or magical arguments, such as the working of various gods or magicians. The Greeks, and later the Romans, tried to explain their world as a system that maybe was started by the gods, but which operated under natural laws that could not be violated. Thus, there was always a, a natural set of laws causing different effects. Democritus, for example, tried to figure out why stuff disappears but is still present. For example, water will evaporate and then condense back again into clouds and rain or, um, um, or on, uh, for example, a cold glass in the summer day. He suggested a law he referred to as um, the atomic law that the water was made of pieces so small, he called them atoms, that he could only see them when there were many of them stuck together. And when they separated from each other, they were too small to see. So the effect of disappearing water is explained by a cause. And he was right, too. Unfortunately, using um, laws based on your observations to explain nature was still not good enough. Often the Greeks and the Romans were dead wrong when it came to natural science. The most famous natural philosopher was Aristotle, who made many wonderful observations and figured out many laws of nature. However, many of his observations just didn't work. For example, he did not believe in atoms. He didn't believe the earth traveled around the sun because it didn't look like it to him. He didn't believe that gravity causes objects to accelerate. All these are fundamental mistakes. So the Greeks were getting better than the older civilizations at explaining uh, things uh, based on cause and effect, but still they were a long way off. <clears throat> then in the development of science, we run into the Dark Ages, especially in Europe. These were times when Roman and Greek civilizations were overthrown by hostile invaders, the Vandals, the Huns, the Visigoths, the Vikings. 
the late Middle Ages, on the other hand, <clears throat> uh, whoops, sorry. Where it says Europe returns to rational thought, uh, saw some hope for science in Europe with the return of ancient, uh, with uh, the older Greek and Arabic learning being brought back from some of the Arab countries. The printing press was invented, which was a leap forward in communication comparable to the invention of the Internet. Still, the invention of modern science had not really happened, and when the bubonic plague hit and killed a third of Europeans in 1348 to 1350, it was still obvious that just staying alive was still an uncertain of, uh, affair. But around the year 1400, the time known as the Renaissance started, in some places became peaceful and prosperous enough to start thinking about laws of nature. Here we find, here we can first start looking at historical figures who practice science as we know it. Let's start with Copernicus. Copernicus was an astronomer <clears throat> who knew the prevailing model for the motions of what he called the heavenly bodies. But he is given credit for testing this model, seeing if it predicted when the stars were, where the stars were in the sky, and rejecting it when its predictions failed. We will look at his alternative model in a minute, but what is important is that Copernicus only followed the model that could be tested by experiments to make sure it was right. To us today, that is how science is done. But in Copernicus's time, the law uh, of nature only had to explain an observation and did not need to be tested carefully. Copernicus knew his method was too radical to be accepted and he didn't want to be punished for it, so he actually refused to publish his model until after his own death, or very close to his death, I think it was. Another person is often called the father of modern science, and that is Galileo. Born soon after Copernicus's death, Galileo decided Copernicus was right, that no law of nature could be believed unless it could be carefully tested by experiments. In this way, he rejected a lot of Aristotle's teachings, uh, Aristotle's teachings because they were wrong when put to the test. Galileo discovered many things this way and was famous, but he also ruffled a lot of feathers with his belief in experimentation. He was eventually imprisoned for the support of the Copernicus model. <clears throat>